So I'm praying, Lord, is this what you want me to do? And Lee Ship texts me from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My dear friend, believe it all. Believe everything. So, so here's what I want to share with you. I honestly, I'm glad you're here this morning because I honestly believe this is what the Lord wants you to hear. There is a plague killing the American church right now. And I'm compelled by the Spirit to warn you so that you can avoid the infection. That's the first statement I wrote. Second, the infection is being disseminated by pulpits and songs that pander to your feelings rather than your eternal well-being. Wow. Now, I readily, I readily admit that, that a little bit of some of this was stirring in my heart from that, that singer from Skillet whose, whose message the body of Christ has circulated. I won't reference it anymore, but I do admit freely that all the way back when we were on our trip in Europe, I saw that and read it, so it's been running around my heart. So the infection is being disseminated by pulpits and songs that pander to your feelings rather than your eternal well-being. Number three, the attractiveness of this infection and its appeal is that you can live your life in neat, packaged, easy-to-define, comfortable boxes of the Christian faith that can be described in catchy cliches and leave you feeling good about yourself at ease and in control. I can only, I can only tell you that, that there is no way that I would have had that kind of flow. I, it would have taken me three or four attempts to write a paragraph like that. I want to read it to you again. The attractiveness of this infection and its appeal is that you can live your life in neat, packaged, easy to define, comfortable boxes of the Christian faith that can be described in catchy cliches but leave you, and leave you feeling good about yourself at ease and in control. Number four, an example of some of these comfortable boxes it's where all you hear about, and I want you to, in your mind, I'm going to have Patty transcribe this, and if you want my notes, I'm happy to send them to you, but, but I've underlined the word all. An example of some of these comfortable boxes that the pulpits and songs of today are encouraging us to camp in is where all you hear about is, A, God's love for you with never any sense that he would ever be displeased with you and that you would ever have to worry about any of your actions or any of your life. He's absolutely, he loves you and he's pleased with you. Now, on the face of it, that's true. You've heard me say that from this pulpit, and it's a very important truth to get in your heart. But if that's all you know about God, if that's the only place you camp out about God, you're going to get the, the plague. B, God's unconditional mercy that any and all judgment was dealt with at the cross and we never have to face any of the judgments of God for unrepented, unconfessed sin. It's all dealt with and unconditional mercy is all you need to know about. C, grace, grace, and more grace, that the law is legalism and therefore bad. So what you need is the grace of God. Live in his grace. Now, again, again, please hear me. All of these things are true, but if it's where you camp out, it's where you've, if it's where you've been encouraged, you see, these things on, the, on, on their own are a, 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 a a good and genuine attempt to re-navigate the body of Christ off of an extreme. See, in my dad's generation, it was law, obey, law, obey, law, obey. No grace, not a whole lot of love of God. It was all obey. And as a result of camping there, that whole generation became legalistic, mean-spirited, They'd have their hair up in a bun. They could speak in tongues, but they could rip you to shreds right after the service is over. 
And so we grew up, a, I'm, not, I'm not covering the whole generation. I'm just saying, because we lived in law and obey, law and obey, we became a very, ju- they became a very judgmental and legalistic. So there's a corrective in the body. But when the corrective, when the medicine becomes all you know, the medicine actually turns into the disease. Grace, 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 and the law of God is out. Don't talk about it. We're, you're actually ridiculed today in today's circles. And I, I, I watch people. I follow people on Twitter on purpose. I follow people on Facebook. I watch what's being said. I watch the debates raging in the body of Christ right now. And if you want to talk about obedience and faithfulness to God, you are in a minority and are actually ridiculed today. D. Faith is a gift of God and requires no work. Just relax. Put your feet up in a spiritual recliner. The the faith that you've got is a gift from God. There's nothing you need to do about it or add to it. In fact, it cannot be added to. So just relax and, and coast all your way to heaven. E, wherever that is. I might have forgotten. I I don't have numbers here. Forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future, is already yours. So relax. No struggle against sin is required. You're already forgiven. Whatever you may commit tomorrow, whatever sin you may commit next week, really doesn't matter. The grace is there. The forgiveness is there. You are forgiven before you even commit the sin. Sounds like the indulgences that the Roman Catholic used to sell in the times of Martin Luther. Your sal- I know I'll make some of you angry here, but just forgive me ahead of time, right? Your salvation is eternally secure, so it doesn't really matter how you live. You've got your salvation. Lastly, growing in your faith and love for God is optional. You got all you need when you were saved. Don't worry, there may be some people that struggle with growing and and being more like Jesus, but that's just a minority. Don't sweat that. You got everything you needed when you were saved. Now listen, each of these truths left standing on their own and emphasized exclusively are actually false and will damn your soul like the false prophets of Jeremiah's day. If that's all you imbibe, and and I just, you may have more and more examples. These are just a few that I felt like the Lord gave me. But But the huge danger, the eternal danger, is if you camp out at one of these things to the exclusion of what the rest of the Scripture is saying about who God is. Here's the good part. The only antidote for this plague is actively pushing into God by the Spirit in His Word, getting the whole counsel of God. Don't cherry-pick your Scriptures. I mean, we're happy if you're in the Scripture at all. The stats about how many Christians are even in the Bible outside of Sundays are tragic and dangerous. But be a man and woman of the Word if you're going to survive the deception that is and is coming more on the body of Christ in America. You've got to be a man or woman of the Word. You've got to know how to rightly divide the Word of truth. You've got to have a reading program. If you don't have one, call the office. We'll get you one where you're a systematic in the Word, and you are reading about the love of God, but you also are being faced square between your eyes with the judgment of God on unconfessed and unrepented sin. You got to be in the Word, folks. We've been saying it a long time, but it's more urgent now than ever. You won't have discernment unless you're in the Word. You'll buy into all the garbage that a lot of Christian uh, publications are selling right now if you're not a man or woman of the Word. Get in the Word of God. Get into one of the groups that Pastor Aaron's working on for this fall that will cause you to study, force you to study the Word and process it with other believers. You've got to be in the Word. Because the only antidote for this great deception is being familiar with who God is. you got to know who He is. Getting the whole counsel of God. Now, when certain truths seem to be in contradiction to each other, and some of you have been at Westgate for a long time, will remember I might have talked about this years ago, but, but, but it, 
it's come full cycle right now where I want to emphasize it again. God's love for you and his displeasure at times is what motivates his discipline of you. You know, we, it's all great to say God loves you and he takes pleasure in you. And I believe that. That's what my dad's generation neglected. God loves you and he takes pleasure in you. But just like any parent, there are times when he is not pleased with you. And if you don't believe that, then explain to me someday why the book of Hebrews talks about don't, don't think it's strange when some painful discipline comes your way because God is actually behind the discipline and he loves you and is disciplining you out of love to shape you into his likeness for his glory. If there's never any displeasure, why would he discipline you and me? Which is why, this is, this is why what the American church is gravitating to is some place, some give me a box in which I can be comfortable. I can deal with the love of God. I can convince myself that he, he loves me. And, and I can handle all of that. Give me a box, but don't tell me that he loves me and sometimes he's displeased with me. Because then... I'm going to have to be in an intimate relationship with him to know which is going on. Then when I face a struggle, rather than just blaming the devil every time, I have to ask the Lord, Lord, is this in my life because you're trying to shape me and correct me? And I had a professor at my doctoral program, Dr. Shabolsky, who actually changed my life with this by teaching me something he calls dialogical tension. You've heard me years ago mention it, but it's been too long. Dialogical tension is where if you would imagine this elbow to be the love of God. He loves you. He takes pleasure in you. Just let that be this elbow. This elbow, he is sometimes displeased with you and will bring discipline your way to shape you into the likeness of Christ. That seems to be contradictory. Dr. Shabolsky said, no, you hook them together like this. And you've got his love for you, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. So you've got his discipline for you right here, and you hook them together. Put your hands together like this for just a moment. It's great. Maybe if you were singing opera like Michael, you could do this to get your breath control where it is, but it's hard to live your life that way because you've got one pulling against the other. You've got this tension. And listen, none of us wants to live in tension. No. Give me a box. Any day, give me a box. Put a box around me. Tell me I'm okay. Tell me I can live in that box and don't have to worry about anything else and that God's in this box with me and I'm a happy camper. Don't tell me that I've got to live in the tension between God's love for me, which is unconditional, and his love for me, which is so intense, he's not going to leave me the way I am. And now you've got some truth between the love of God and the discipline of God. You hook them together. It's called dialogical tension. Dialogical means one is speaking to the other. That love is speaking to discipline, and discipline is speaking to love. And when you hook them together, your life is lived a little bit like this sometimes, but it's okay because it pushes you into God. And the more you get pushed into God, the better off you're going to be. Yes. Listen. The next one. God's mercy on one hand, and the New Testament reality of judgment, listen, for unrepented sin. Now, I know my dad's generation grew up, and I grew up as a consequence with sin being so hammered at me and repentance that I would get saved every Sunday night <laughs> all over again. It was the evangelistic sermon. Dad always preached that way. I'd go forward because I'd done something wrong that week, inevitably. And so I lived in this constant fear that, that I was under the punishment of God. But you don't, 
you don't solve this by dismissing the judgment of God. If you're going to dismiss the judgment of God as not New Testament, then come and tell me, what are you going to do with Ananias and Sapphira? If you're going to dismiss the judgment of God as not New Testament any longer, what are you going to do with Jesus telling the man that was crippled from birth that he healed, and Jesus said to him, go and sin no more, lest something worse happens to you. Sounds a little bit like judgment to me. What do you do with Jesus' letter to the Ephesians or to the Laodiceans where he said, I'm coming. In fact, he says to Smyrna, there you've got a Jezebel amongst you that's teaching sexual immorality is okay and acceptable. You tell her that I'm giving her a chance to repent, but if she doesn't, I'm putting her on a sick bed and her children will die. Now, don't tell me that we don't serve a God who still judges unrepented sin. No, judgment is still a reality. And if you try to live your life, I'm not saying, please hear me, please hear me. I'm not saying that you got to live like I did my teenage years where every time I did something wrong, I imagined a holy angel with a giant eraser running over to the Lamb's Book of Life, finding Roland's and rubbing my, erasing my name. I'm not talking about that kind of perpetual insecurity. But I'm telling you that you can't live in conscious unrepentant, willful sin, and not at some point have the judgment of God on you because he loves you too much. And listen, there's two kinds of judgment. I wish I'd thought about this in the first service. There is redemptive judgment, and there's final judgment. Judgment is always from God with an eye to redemption. Final judgment is what... what Ananias and Sapphira tragically encountered. It's, there's no turning back after final judgment. So I'm not, please, I'm not saying that we're going to start living, you're going to start hearing about judgment. I'm just saying to you that in this crazy world we live in, you never hear about the judgment of God. You're being told, like I was told by, a, a, by someone here just a year or so ago, that because God, Jesus took all the punishment on the cross, there's no judgment and no punishment left. No, that's not true at all. Yes, he took the punishment for our salvation. All right, you still, are we still friends? There's still judgment for unrepented sin, and I best live with that understanding. Not ducking. I'm not talking about the extreme of ducking every time God is around because you feel he's going to smack you upside the head. I know that's a prevailing sentiment that needs to be dismissed. But you can't swing then to the other extreme of God's mercy and not believe there's judgment. If there's no judgment, what's the mercy all about? Three, or, or C, grace and the law of God are still required in obedience. So you hook up grace, which is through no merit of your own, as a gift of God, you've been forgiven and cleansed, but then you've got to put the law on this side and realize that Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey me. We got all kinds of churches growing up right now around the notion that you can live any way you want in any kind of sexual encounters and relationships that you want. And, and as long as you come and raise your hand and sing on Sunday, you're going to be just fine. No. No, you're not going to be just fine. No. The grace of God means that you love him so much you're going to obey him. Grace and law. You can't dismiss the law of God. You cannot. Jesus said he came to fulfill the law, not to do away with the law. All right? Grace and law. Faith as a gift and working out your salvation. Two apparently contradicting statements that don't contradict at all when you get them hooked together in your understanding of who God is. Rest in the power of God and striving in prayer for his will and the kingdom of God. There is actually a teaching that John Wesley countered in his day that since Jesus has done it all, that there's nothing for you to do but sit back, put up your easy chair, fold your arms, and just rest. Just great, isn't this rest in God? 
great. Don't have to worry about a thing. No, there are times to rest in God. He said, uh, he, uh, the psalmist David said, he'll lead you beside still waters. He'll restore your soul. But let me tell you something. If you're in the middle of a battle and you need your helmet on and your sword on and the shield up, you better not be quoting no laying me down to sleep in some green patches because you get your butt kicked by the enemy. And then you'll wonder, and you'll call in here for prayer because you wonder what's going on. No, you've got to understand that there's rest and there's striving, and you can find both of them in the Word of God. Paul actually commends some of his colleagues for striving over the church in Colossae. He says to the church in Galatians, I'm striving over you like a mother being birthed, having a child be birthed all over again. There's both. John Wesley called it quietism. Will you just relax? Nothing to do, just relax. No, it's gonna, you're going to get into trouble. Forgiveness of sin and the confession and repentance that brings that forgiveness into our lives. Yes, your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. That's only because Jesus has provided for your forgiveness once for all, but you still have to ask for it. If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So forgiveness and confession go hand in hand. You can't just live glibly, sinning willy-nilly any way you want and think the forgiveness of God's going to cover you. That's why I'm saying I believe with all my heart that the sermon could be the eternal future for some of you. Because you can't just live for the devil and because you made a decision for Christ at an altar 20 years ago, think everything's going to be hunky-dory. God, keep us from this plague. Security of our salvation and the clear New Testament teaching that after repeated calling of the Holy Spirit, apostasy is possible. And don't say, well, it really means if you could become apostate, it means you weren't Christian from the first, in the first place. Tell that the Apostle Paul who says in Corinthians that I, I beat my physical appetites into submission lest after teaching all of you I miss the mark myself. What's he doing? He's living in that tension, right? He's living in the tension. That's where, that's where the American church doesn't want to live. We want to live in a comfortable place where we can put our feet up and, and sing uh, the hallelujah chorus all the way to eternity. No, there's some work to be done. Yeah. Got to live in that tension. Lastly, salvation is not only a one-time entry into eternal life, but an entry into a life in Christ where you glorify his name and grow from glory to glory. Some of us got saved 40 years ago and stalled out. It's time to start growing in the grace of God. It's what you're called to. It's what salvation means. So I want, I want to leave you. I, I, I actually feel so strongly about this. I'm putting it in a blog for, for Heidi to, to post next week for me. And I'm going to see if Brian... I didn't do a very good job of describing this. So I want to see if Brian can sketch it, Brian Hepler, or find a picture of something. Because I want you to see that we, our flesh, resists having to grow in a tension. But the tension is resolved when you press in to God. Amen. This is not even about avoiding the lists. This is about pressing into God. Because discernment in your life will come from Him He'll be the authenticator of the, of the messages and songs that you hear. So you don't have to go on a witch hunt. You just have to draw near to him. And the more you know him and grow near to him, the more like him you become. Amen? Are we still friends? Will we stand? Would you stand for prayer, please? Father, Holy Father, we present ourselves to you as a fellowship today. Lord, the world around us is going mad, and in too many instances, your church is deceived. 
and being killed by the plague. Oh God, I would ask for those in this congregation who are under the hearing of my voice today, I would ask on their behalf and all of the folks that call Westgate home, those who are here and those who are vacationing, I just ask, Father, would you bring us into that intimacy with you and that walk with you that we are okay living in the tension between what looks like contradictory truths but in reality are truths that need to be hooked together so that we can find in that tension what you have in store for our lives. Speak to us today. Convict us today if we've fallen into the trap of the disease. Help us to know that you are both the lover of our souls and the one who loves us so much, he will not leave us in our sin that destroys. Raise up your church, Lord Jesus. Raise up a holy bride ready for your return. And by your spirit, let Westgate be that radiant bride without spot or wrinkle or blemish that you're coming for. And let us all, beginning with this pastor, my colleagues and the board members and leaders and teachers throughout this congregation, oh God, cause us to live in that tension, happily leaving to you the shaping of our lives and your guidance and the wisdom of your spirit to lead us into truth as we allow these truths of yours to infiltrate our thinking and our values and be incorporated into everything that becomes our lives from this day onwards. Because we are yours, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. In your name. Amen. Church, if you'll stay standing, and, and I just ask that nobody leave right now. I think when we hear a word so strong, we need to respond. And as I've been asking the Lord, how would you have us to respond to you? Oh God, we wanna be a teachable church. We wanna be a responsive church. How would you have us to respond? I think there are many of us this morning that need to repent for wanting God in a box for letting others define him for us because it feels more comfortable and we can be in control of it, for creating a God in our own image because it helps us to understand. And so I would ask if you would pray with me out loud a prayer of repentance, that when God looks down over Westgate Chapel, he sees a people that are quick to say, God, we hear your voice. This was so much on your heart that you put it on our pastor's heart last night. So God, I wanna be quick to respond. Yeah. So if you'll repeat after me, God, I repent for wanting you in a box. God, I repent for letting others define you. I repent for creating my own definition of you. A God in my own image, in my own so, I so I could be uncomfortable, so I could stay in control. And now if we'll just commit ourselves to the Lord, Lord, I commit, Lord, I commit to actively push into you, push into you. with the grace of the Holy Spirit, the of the Holy Spirit. and through the word, to let you define yourself. I will live in this tension. I commit to live in tension and let you be God in Jesus' name. Some of you need to come to the altar and spend time with the Lord. Let him work this into your heart. I invite you to do that. Our prayer team will also be here. If you have specific needs where you would like prayer, come in and meet with one of them, but also feel free to just kneel at the altar and take this word to the Lord in your own way. Respond in your own way to him.
let's close with our benediction. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you.